Namaste. Welcome to the course on sampling. The topic is bias, sampling bias and non-sampling bias. The context is bias in research are to be identified, eliminated to the extent possible. You will get bias at every stage of your research. Sampling bias occupies a space as one of the elements of bias. We will discuss bias, sampling bias and non-sampling bias. I have included bias discussion as it will help us to understand the various types of biases we are going to encounter in our research. However, I am, we are not going to study the biases, cognitive biases which we will see in behavioral finance. We will confine ourselves to bias, sampling bias and non-sampling bias. bias. Therefore, we predict that there will be an error as the outcome is expressed as a set of predictor variables multiplied by a set of coefficients, the parameters in the equation and tell us about the relationship between the predictor and outcome variable. The prediction will not be perfect as there will be an error as we are using sample data to predict the outcome variable. Now, what are all the contexts under which these biases arise? Now, the biases may arise in the parameter estimates. Therefore, when we are looking at the population parameters, there may be a chance for bias entering there. Things that bias standard error and confidential interval. If the sample distribution and the sample error is not estimated and bias enter there, you are likely to have biases in this area. Things that bias test statistics and p-values. These biases are related. If the test statistics are biased, then the confidence interval will also be biased. A bias in confidence interval will bias test statistics. Therefore, you can find there is a domino effect of the bias entering into one area is likely to impact the other areas. If the test statistic is biased, then the results will be biased and we need to identify and eliminate the biases as much as possible. We have to be very careful in understanding these biases and try to eliminate their impact from our research. Now, assumptions that lead to bias. Therefore, there are five assumptions. And the first assumption is probably we can say there is a presence of outliers. Outliners, we think that there is no presence of outliers as an assumption. But sometimes there will be presence of outliners. We have to be careful about them. The next one is additivity and linearity. The third one is normality. Fourth one is independence. And fifth one is homoscedanticity or homogeneity of variance. These five biases we will discuss during the course of our lecture. Presence of output outliners in data will bias the data. For example, if the class average marks is 60 and standard deviation is 10 marks, then if there is presence of 0 marks for some students, 3 to 4 students or 100 marks for a few students may bias the data because it is not the representative of the complete data. It is ideal to remove those outliers and then redo our research. However, you may go through 
who are all the outliers and what exactly their characteristics separately. But having them in the data is likely to bias your parameter estimation. The outliers need to be identified and removed or replaced to have a better representation of data. It generally affects the mean of the data as well as some of the squares error. The sum of the squares is used to compute the standard deviation which in turn is used to estimate the standard error. Now you can see the impact of outliers is impacting the sum of the squares and in turn the standard deviation and in turn the estimation of standard error. The standard error is used for confidence intervals around the parameter estimates. This will have a domino effect on the results. Therefore, by identifying the outliers, which can be done by looking at the distribution, looking at the histogram and various areas, you will be able to find those outliers. The next one is additivity and linearity. This is a very important assumption, but it may be restrictive. The assumption is that outcome variable is linearly related to all predictors. That means the relationship may be summed up as a straight line. If there are several predictors as we see in the equation which we have given earlier, this their combined effect is described by adding their effects together. Therefore, additivity principle says that you can all add all the predictors effect and then try to estimate the outcome. The model can describe accurately by the given equation here. Assumption of normality. There is a mistaken belief that assumption of normality is equal to the data need to be from normally distributed. The misconception stems from the fact that the data is normally distributed, the errors in the model as well as sampling distribution is also normally distributed. This is a correct statement. If the data is normally distributed, that the errors in the model as well as sampling distribution is also normally distributed. Now, the central limit theorem means that there are different situations in which we can assume normality regardless of the shape of the sample data. Now, let me explain this more clearly. Normality matters when you construct confidence intervals around parameters of the model or compute significant tests relating to those parameters, then assumption of normality matters in small samples, that is very important. If the sample size is large enough, then the assumption of normality of population is not much important. As long as sample size is fairly large, outliers are taken into account, the assumption of normality will hold good for the samples. This is the essence of central limit theorem. This is the case even with significant tests of the model will not be affected if the samples are large in number. Therefore, it is most important for us to have to be able to estimate the sample size and have random sampling so that you will be able to have a better reporting of results. Homoscedanticity or homogeneity of variance. So far we have talked about how the bias can affect the means. The third assumption is based on the concept of variance. In design of experiments involving different groups of respondents, this assumption means 
they come population with same variance. In correlation design, the outcome variable should be stable for different levels of predictor variable. Let me explain little further. Now, if, let me give an, oh, probably we will go for an example and then we will discuss this concept more in detail. If a set of teachers are sent to different FTP programs and you wish to measure their ability to retain the content, the mean ability to retain may be differing across the programs conducted at different institutions. However, the variance is required to be same across the programs which we call it as homoscedanticity or homogeneity of variance. That means, across the programs, the mean may differ. However, the variance should not be different. It should have almost equal variance. If this is violated, you will have heteroscedanticity. When in analysis aspect gets importance, if the linear model and estimate parameters are assumed, optimum results can be get if there is homogeneity of variance by method of least squares. Similarly, if the variances are not equal along the predictor variable, optimum results cannot be obtained. Therefore, non homoscedanticity is likely to bias the confidence intervals, model parameter estimates and test of significance. This aspect need to be taken care in your research. Probably about these issues you will study more in research methodology course. Now independence. We assume that the errors in the model or independent are not correlated. If you are testing memory recall of students, they are supposed to give their recall without conferring with others. If A, B, C are tested and if they confer on what they have recalled, then the independence of their recall is violated and we may not be able to get the optimum estimate of the model. This is because the standard error is getting biased and in turn confidence interval and the estimates. If such assumptions are violated, we find contextual variables entering into the entire focus and we use different methodology for studying them. But here in a linear model, we will be violating the rule of independence. Let me reiterate. So when we are studying any kind of a research, for example, you give a questionnaire to people who are working in different departments in the organization. If a group of a group in a particular department they all join together and then try to fill the entire instrument collectively rather than individually, then also you will lose the independence. Therefore, you need to ensure that whenever you are giving your instruments or whenever you are testing or experimenting, the output they give should be independent of the output that are given by various other people. Therefore, this important aspect of independence need to be kept in mind while having bias in our research. There are five major bias that are likely to impact the model or experimental results. There are methods to identify bias. There is a discussion on general bias. Therefore, we need to identify these biases and then try to minimize them or to eliminate them. Now, the next and most important thing is sampling bias. It is also known as selection bias, an error in choosing participants for a scientific study 
such that results are distorted. This is a very important definition. Therefore, there is an error in choosing the participants. When we are trying to study or experiment, we will be choosing the participants. In fact, how do we choose the participants? We try to call for a volunteers, then try to pick them up. But when we are doing all these dimensions while creating your sample frame, bias is likely to enter. Bias is an error that occurs when something about the way a survey is designed or conducted leads to results that are systematically different from what is true in the population, but not something negative connotation as being something negative. This is very important. In our general parlance, we say bias is something, you know, you are against somebody, you are against. It is not that way. Here, bias occurs when the sampling process that we design is likely to have imperfect results due to our choice of participants. Let us explain. There are three common sources of sampling error. Random sampling error is the deviation between the sample statistic and the population parameter caused by chance in selecting the random sample. In selection of random sample, we may make mistakes. Bad sampling methods, voluntary response sampling, convenience sampling, and under coverage when some groups in the population are excluded. Therefore, these are all the three common sources of sampling error. Now, first one is self-selection bias. In newspaper, wish to study the computer usage by students. If the students are asked to volunteer to provide information, the survey may attract students who are interested in technology rather than usage of computers. Such bias is known as self-selection bias. Let us take another example. If volunteers are asked to come for an experiment on bribery and after knowing the experimental details may, may not drop up giving rise to self-selection bias. This is something, therefore, this self-selection is likely to bias your entire results rather than to have random chance of being selected. There is a bias in the selection process. Under coverage bias. There is a classical example. Literary Digest, a magazine in the United States of America, in 1936, surveyed and found that one of the candidates, Landon, will win an election against Roosevelt by a large margin. But turned out to be Roosevelt won by a large margin. After examination of this survey, it was found that the survey was taken by telephone and telephone was expensive during those days. It was worn by rich who are likely to be Landon supporters. This coverage did not include people from different strata of poor and people living in the fringes, resulted in the under coverage bias. This is very important. Many a times we may get the results from people who are, for example, if you do an internet on Facebook in our country, you may not be reaching almost all the people in the world. In, the, in the our India, there are large number of people may not be having the Facebook or any other social media. Therefore, under coverage bias is very important aspect to be taken into account while selecting samples. And the same, the same research square showed that in addition to under coverage bias, there are non-responsive bias. The non-responsive bias occurred when Landon supporters are likely to return the forms more than the Roosevelt supporters. Therefore, Landon supporters 
or the people who are more responsive compared to the Roosevelt supporters in the process, there is under coverage bias. In addition to under coverage, there is a non responsive bias. This thing has to be taken into account in our research. Now, this is very important survivorship bias. This may be explained with an example from study of mutual funds. While studying the mutual funds, we may tend to exclude organizations that were closed. This is likely to bias the results in favor of only surviving organizations, giving rise to survivorship bias. Therefore, whenever we are studying any phenomena, it is right to include include those organizations which have failed also in order to have an appropriate appropriate results. Let me give some more example. Gary Smith, an economist, also pointed out the bias in the book by Jim Collins, Good to Great, where he selected 11 companies that performed better for the 40 years and identified their characteristics. Gary Smith pointed out that is, it is not research but history as in 2011, four of the 11 companies did not perform to the extent of their peers. This he called it as survivorship bias. For example, the large number of companies that Jim Collins have taken, he has studied only 11 companies which have outperformed their peers. But he has not included people who have failed. Therefore, there is a survivorship bias that is built into the entire system. And here is a reference by Michael Shermer, who has written how the survivor bias distorts reality in Scientific American. Now, survivorship bias, an example you can also take in World War II, the statistician Abraham Ward used survivorship bias into his decision making process while considering minimization of bomber losses by enemy bombing. They examined the planes that have reached back and they found, you can see in the plane, the various places where they were hit. Researchers suggested that after conducting the study of the damage done to the aircraft that are back from missions and has recommended that the armor to be added in the areas that showed the most damage, he recommended the opposite because the planes that are going, that are not going to return are the planes which are not survived the entire bombing. Therefore, more on engine and in other areas, they were hit and they have not survived. Therefore, he took the survivorship bias into his decision making process and in the process, he has achieved better results. Now, non-sampling errors. If you actually look at the Pew research, you will find that way back in 19, 97, 36 American percent of American population were able to give response for all their questions. Therefore, survey research has 36 percent of response rate. Over a period of time, it has come down and it has come to 9 percent. Some of the researchers in India have found that only 2 percent of surveys sent are returned back. Therefore, there is a large number of people who are not willing to give us information. Now, response error occurs when the subject gives an incorrect response. It is a non-sampling error. Many a times, the respondent is likely to give an incorrect response, thinking that he may be looked bad in the eyes of the person or any other reason. And non-sampling error is the failure to obtain the data from an individual selected for the sampling. 
most non response happens due to inability to contact the subjects or subjects are not willing to give the information or they are not willing to cooperate now question wording is also may lead to non sampling errors if the questions are drafted in such a way that it will emotions in the respondents and may give a positive or a negative based on the wording of the questionnaire it becomes a non sampling error if you look into the entire biases that enter into the realm of research you have five different biases which will enter which is likely to distort the various parameters and other statistical tests and we need to identify and eliminate them number 3 number 2 is the number of sampling biases which we have seen various survivorship bias we have seen all those biases while studying the sampling bias and non sampling errors is one thing when there is large number of people who are not going to or not willing to give us information and some subjects give an incorrect information the wording of question is such that it may lead to non sampling error therefore these are all the various kinds of biases that you have to keep in mind while reporting your research now let me conclude we have discussed the five different bias which are generally the statistical bias that enter into our research we need to identify them these five biases and then remove them eliminate them or try to minimize their impact in order to obtain appropriate report the second one is sampling bias in sampling bias you have to identify the various types of biases that will actually enter when we are trying to select the participants and trying to find what kind of a response they are going to give and there is a set of non sampling biases may also enter into our research therefore when we design a model and when we have an outcome variable which is given by a set of predictor variables you will see at every stage biases may enter we have to be conscious about these biases and try to minimize them i wish you all the best please do contact us in our discussion forum and give your feedback thank you very much namaste 